work. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to take some some camera lessons from you next time next time we meet. So. <laughs> All right, to fill everyone in, uh, just just to satisfy Constantine's ego, there is he has probably one of the most dope camera setups <laughs> possible <laughs> that for whatever reason, with whatever system we're using, just simply won't work unless everyone is content with having a little moving box on top of your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we don't want we that. Tried. Yeah. We tried. We tried. Back to basics. Uh, back to basics. Well, back to basics for me. Um, I'm hoping out of this conversation, I'm going to learn a little bit more about um, about the real KB, um, you know, behind behind the channel, um, but also about I've got some funny questions because I, I very rarely get the opportunity to talk to a German MW, uh, and so I thought you could enlighten me on to some some fun different German facts, if you will. Can you tell me because I, I I think about wine, like say Barolo. Barolo makes sense in the context of Northern Italy. You know, we've got 30 egg per kilo pasta, creamy dishes. We've got large amounts of, you know, mushrooms and you, you need some tannin. You need some acid. You've got curry burst. <laughs> how does that coexist with Riesling? How does, how does Riesling become the predominant thing? I've, I've, is there, is there food styles that I just don't know about from Germany that, that specifically that evolved alongside? I don't know. I, I mean, there's obviously more to German cuisine than currywurst, worst, even, though, even though we are not the strongest when it comes to uh, culinary explorations. Um, but but um, I think in Germany, it's probably not, not... I mean, Italy and France are just very different in terms of uh, the way their food culture evolved around uh, having wine on the table and having, having food on the table and then kind of uh, trying to marry that. In Germany, obviously, the, the beer culture is still uh, pretty strong um, and there's less, less of an emphasis on fine food and fine wine. I think that has changed over the last decades. But it's still um, not at the same level as uh, what you what you get in Italy and France. So, so I think Riesling is more the reason why Riesling is so popular in Germany, and it wasn't always. I mean, there was a time when, in the not so distant future, uh, not so distant past, where where Müller Thurgau actually was the most widely planted grape variety in Germany, and Riesling kind of fell out of fashion. But but yeah, Riesling is just a great variety that can deal really well with the cold and humid uh, conditions, and that's kind of what Germany was used uh, was was famous for, like bad weather, um, and and really cold winters. That has obviously also changed uh, in in the recent past, but uh, I think that's that was more the reason why people really focused on Riesling, and then they realized that they're um, that it's a great variety that can produce awesome things, even though. Um, Germans are still not as proud of uh, their Riesling wines as uh, the Italians are of their best uh, Nebbiolos and best Sangioveses or the French are uh, of their best Pinots and best Cabernet Sauvignons. Wait, 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 Germans aren't proud about their Riesling? Seriously? No, I don't think so. I mean, if you if you are traveling in wine circles, obviously uh, people uh, think Riesling is a great grape variety. But uh, the the average German doesn't drink, uh, I, I doesn't doesn't uh, love Riesling because Riesling has a lot of acidity. Um, it's a grape variety that you kind of have to have to get used to in order to really enjoy it. Um, I mean, there are so many wine nerds, uh, wine experts, wine authors that are saying Riesling is the greatest uh, white grape variety. And still, people all around the world don't really get Riesling as they get Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. So in Germany, wow. Grauburgunder, Pinot Gris is really a very popular style. Uh, Lugana, uh, which is an Italian uh, white, um, that, that is also something lots of Germans really enjoy. But, um, but yeah, Riesling is not necessarily a mass market thing in Germany. And that's also why... The best Rieslings, which can be just absolutely delicious, I just did a, did a uh, big tasting of uh, lots of great Rieslings from the 2023 vintage. And that's for me, that's heaven, even though after 
like after a hundred wines, your your palate starts to deteriorate, literally. But 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 anyways, um, yeah, th those wines they they are still retailing at pretty reasonable prices compared to the best wines of uh, France, Italy, probably even compared <clears throat> to the best wines of Australia. You know, I mean, uh, the best Rieslings are. I mean, there's some that uh, sell for more than 100 euros, but, but that's really just a couple of handful of, of, of wine brands. It's surprising because, I mean, obviously Germany's history with Riesling, like Riesling used to be some of the most expensive wine in the world. You've got like and, and some of the most long-lived wines in the world, some of the most historic, grown on some of the most insane sites, and even that's not enough to impress the Germans. Yeah, yeah, we, we're hard to impress, <laughs> and 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 uh, I think Germans overall are also not extremely patriotic, uh, like uh, the average German at least. Uh, after the Second World War, we decided uh, mm. that being patriotic is maybe not the best way to go move forward. <laughs> so 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 we that's also that's also why we we don't necessarily. Um, uh, yeah, are not as proud as as some other uh, people, some other nationalities of their best and finest things. Um, so, and, and Constantine, I just want to highlight for the in the first five minutes of our chat. Not only have you said that Germans basically hate Riesling, you've also <laughs> said that they're not patriotic for obvious reasons. <laughs> this is going to go great for the next next little yeah. <laughs> what so? What about Asiatic cuisine? Because like Riesling and Asiatic cuisine has been so incredibly sort of intertwined. But my understanding of German culture is that Asiatic cuisine is not really embraced either. Yeah, I mean, I think that we, we are less close to it than you would be. For example, there not not those big um, Asian communities, if you can call them mm. that. I mean, there's obviously Asia is quite quite a big continent with lots of different cultures, but. But um, yeah, it's not. We don't have a Chinatown anywhere in mm. in, in Germany. Um, there's actually a larger population of Japanese people living in in, a, in Düsseldorf, uh, the city where Pro Wine takes place, where we last met. Um, but but yeah, there's there's there are fewer really great Asian uh, restaurants in Germany, I think, compared to some other countries. So 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 you don't see that. That often, but but yeah, I mean, Riesling can work really well with certain Asian dishes and Asian cuisine styles. Um, even though, I, I mean, I'm not an expert uh, when it comes to Asian cuisine, but but even I know that that it's quite diverse and complex, and you can't just mm. compare uh, Japanese cuisine to Korean cuisine, even though they are actually not so far away. And uh, China is a whole world. On its own, with many different uh, different styles and directions that uh, the cuisines take. So, so yeah. But but yeah. Obviously, uh, due to especially a certain style of German wine, which is also a style that doesn't really exist much anywhere else in the world, uh, works really well with spicy food um, that isn't super um, aromatic, but still has quite a lot of aroma. And that's kind of the Riesling Cabinet Spätlese style mm. of wine, where you have residual sugar, 50 grams, 60, 70 grams of residual sugar, but the wine doesn't taste sweet because of the acidity, which is so vibrant and fresh and lively. Um, and that's obviously can be a nice match with certain kinds of dishes. And then on top of that, those wines oftentimes have really low alcohol levels. So, so we're talking about seven to nine percent of of alcohol. And those uh, those spicy dishes, if you put alcohol on top of that, it gets too spicy oftentimes. And uh, so, so the cabinet wines with their sugar, with their aroma and with their low level of alcohol can be a great match there. Well, it seems like it's obviously been heavily embraced. I was actually really quite um, uh, surprised with the quality of Japanese produce in Dusseldorf as well. Yeah. That's, that's like such a, a little secret. Is that because also World War II as well? Is that what happened? Um, I, I don't think they came there because of World War II, but I actually don't necessarily know why uh, why there is such a big Japanese uh, uh, community in Dusseldorf. I just know that there is. Uh, I think it's actually one of the bigger or biggest uh, Japanese communities outside of Japan. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, I'll, I'll I'll research that for you. I'm actually there <laughs> next week, so 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 I can I can check I can check. We gotta go through. Give me give me the whole list of all the food to eat next time we're we're there for pro wine. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned Mula Turgau. Mula Turgau is is that a cross? That's a like a yeah. It's uh, actually a, a cross that was developed at the university where I studied Geisenheim. in Geisenheim. Yeah. So 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 they also have a research. Uh, institute and they for a long time time thought it was Riesling and Zavanna uh, as a cross uh, so um, uh, um, yeah that, that was kind of why, why it was also called uh, what was it called Rieslana I think um, yes yeah 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 something like that um, but but it's actually a cross between oh I definitely knew that and should know that, but Madeleine Royale and Riesling, I think. Riesling and Madeleine Royale. So, so, um, so it's a, yeah, a different kind of cross. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, but, but uh, <laughs> that's certainly something you learn very early on in Germany uh, as, a, as a wine student, but, but I've, I've forgotten many of the things I learned early on. <laughs> so, so yeah, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a cross developed in, in Geisenheim and, and they are still fairly proud of it, um, even though it's not necessarily a great variety of great reputation, but, but, but it's still a great variety that had, had a strong impact and still is quite relevant in the German wine industry, but not for producing great wines usually. I mean, there are some, some better examples, but, but most of them are pretty entry-level, easy-going mm. whites. And they were very successful for a period, for that period, where Germany really focused just on producing massive amounts of of cheap uh, sweet wines, um, and and uh, and that's why Mulatoga kind of rose to to uh, the number one spot in in, in Germany uh, when it came to plantings. Because there's some pretty pretty old vines out there. I remember trying a couple of Mulatogals while I was over there recently, and I was like, I didn't even know that there was like fifty, sixty year old vines. Yeah, I mean, it has been around for a long time. I think it was crossed in uh, in at the towards the end of the 19th century. I think 1882 was when it's when it was released. So so um, yeah, so it's it has been around for a long time. So there must be some old vines. Um, but but yeah, it's it's actually it's actually fairly popular in New Zealand as well. It was at least uh, fairly popular in New Zealand. It was I think the most widely planted grape variety there. I don't know whether it ever had an impact on on Australia when it comes to wine production, but but yeah, in Germany it was it was an important, or is still an important grape variety. Yeah, we've we've not seen not seen much. I mean, I imagine obviously they must have crossed it because it was just really like climatically suited. I'm I'm assuming is it is it what you guys would call? Because you guys, we have the kiwis, you guys have the peewees. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which was a new was a new whole term for me. So yeah. is this is this like a cause of concern now for like German viticulturalists and wineries where you're looking towards these sort of more hardy grape varieties? Because a lot of them are crosses, aren't they? A lot of them are uh, um, like not just random grape varieties, but they're specific crosses for handling. Yeah, they're like, usually like hybrids. Condition. So usually yeah. hybrids between Vitis vinifera a Vitis vinifera grape variety and another um, kind of family of uh, Vitis uh, grapes. And um, I think it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily, uh, the, the interest in, in those grape varieties is not necessarily based on the fact that the weather conditions are so terrible in Germany. I think that has changed quite a bit uh, over recent years, even though this year and last year were a little bit more difficult. But overall, Germany has much more um, much, much more agreeable uh, weather conditions uh, during during mm. the growing season of the grapes um, at least but in Germany I think it kind of developed because of that and uh, but it's also part of the organic uh, movement uh, there's a fairly strong movement in Germany towards organic uh, and uh, having having organic products uh, the green party has been a strong party in germany focusing on all environmental issues and obviously when it comes to viticulture um, even even uh, bio even organic or, or biodynamic uh, viticulture 
you you are relying on uh, sulfur, uh, which isn't that big a deal, but but uh, it's the copper that is a <clears throat> real real issue um, for, um, for 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 winemakers all around the world because it obviously accumulates in the soil, uh, it doesn't disappear, and in regions where there's a lot of uh, wine production, there's quite quite a lot of copper in the soil and. And being able to avoid that, and by by just planting um, grape varieties that are able to withstand or are resistant to to the fungal diseases that plague wine for a long, long time, um, that that's 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 interesting. That's something people are more open to hear. The only issue is that most of those wines kind of. Taste crap, <laughs> so 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 they 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 they're, they're still like the the search for the holy grail. There's really having a grape variety that that you can plant in the vineyard without having to worry too much about fungal diseases. There's also economic uh, concerns involved in that because if you don't have to spray, you you're saving a lot of money uh, for the the product that you bring out in the vineyard, labor, um, gas, and all that. Um, mm. But yeah, having 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 that plus uh, having something that tastes really great, uh, and that, that it, it hasn't been a perfect match. I've I've tasted quite a few PVs. There are few that are interesting, um, and some that are really nice that I would enjoy drinking. But most of them are really terrible. So <laughs> at least at least to my palate. So so yeah, they're not there's, not a lot of fun most of the time. There's not a lot of hybrids or like sort of man-made crosses i suppose that have ever actually kind of really broken through into the mainstream are there there was i mean muller turgal certainly mainstream but in terms of being sort of held up as being almost like a noble grape variety it's you know a lot of the peewees or like pinotage i suppose yeah. has a bit of a reputation it can do some great wines but a lot of people don't like them uh, is there any sort of crosses that come to mind or man-made crosses that you think are like, hey, we're, we're under something here? Have you heard of Tarango? There's an Australian-made cross. Do you know about Tarango? No, not, not really, no. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find this on short notice. Tarango, what is Tarango uh, grapes? It was made by, t no, yeah, no, Tarango, T-A-R-R-A-N-G-O. It's an Australian cross between Tariga. Okay. Which makes some pretty good wine, pretty good wine. Yeah. We're starting out pretty well with Tariga, but of course, being Australia, we thought it'd be smart to blend that with Sultana, uh, okay, and well. some, <laughs> somehow <laughs> turn it into good wine. That's, that's pretty random. That is pretty. That's that's the way it goes down under, mate. Um, yeah. You know, okay. Yeah, but I, I don't. Sultana. I don't really know any man-made crosses that are really. That are really great that I really enjoy. I mean, most grape or all grape varieties, I guess, are, are crosses. Mm. Uh, most of them occurred naturally somewhere in in, in nature, um, and through the process of kind of eliminating the stuff that doesn't bring good results, people kind of came up with the the grape varieties that we use nowadays most of most of the time, um, and the whole crossing business is is not very old so so in, in, mm. and in most cases especially during that period at the end of the 19th century beginning to first half of the 20th century uh, there wasn't as much focus probably on quality wine production anywhere in the world it was more about kind of uh, uh, the populations were rising people needed something mm. to to drink uh, and so so everyone was searching for for grape varieties that are producing high yields on a reliable basis, they were using or looking at different factors in order to cross those grape varieties. And uh, nowadays the situation is different, um, but but I mean establishing a crossing, uh, having it, uh, having winemakers planted all around the world or in in the right spots, uh, test test them for a bit. That just takes time. So, so I guess there will be mm. probably better crosses uh, in this century than the, like man-made uh, crosses in this century than there ever were before. But yeah, I, I don't, I couldn't think of any anything um, man-made, any man-made cross that I would say is something I enjoy drinking. Even Pinotage is not something that I really 
really have that much fun with. I mean, there are good examples, obviously, but but yeah, it's not one of my favorite grape varieties. I suppose there's definitely good examples of every grape variety. Uh, the, I think about some weird shit, Constantine, uh, and I sometimes think about if we were to somehow man make Nebbiolo, how would we reverse engineer, you know, that situation? How how would like the decision making around blending a grape variety land on a grape that effectively hurts you, um, you know, with, with such bracing tannin and such high acidity or same thing with Riesling. I mean, is it even possible for us to, to cross a grape with the motivations to, to not die effectively, I guess, dilute its flavor. Cause that's what these things are like these Pinotages and Miller and Tarangos even they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, cool. they're, they're about like yield. They're, they're very much yeah. like commercially like motivated, aren't they? It's about yield or disease resistance. But when we get sort of to the crux, the actual final thing that kind of matters, you know, flavor, mm. you know, a lot of the wines that we all consume, I guess, are like quite asymmetric, aren't they? Um, you know, Riesling is probably arguably too much acidity. I disagree. I could always have more acidity in Australia. Um, but you know, Nebbiolo arguably has too much tannin, can be quite a polarizing grape variety, but nonetheless, it's still, you know, exceptionally sort of celebrated. Yeah. How do you reckon, how do you, re- like, what's what's the next big grape variety? Is, are these always going to be commercially motivated until it's like a, it's like a suck it and see? We just, you know, plant out everything randomly until we find something that tastes good? Well, I think... Um... I think when you're talking about man-made crosses, right? What's the next mm. big man-made cross? I think personally, I mean, there are just like there, there are too many wines already on this planet. Uh, I, I also think that there are probably too many grape varieties uh, out there and, and just kind of working with what we have and identifying interesting new things out of the existing grape variety mm. pool that we have is probably the better idea rather than just kind of looking adding, at the, adding more to it looking at trying to figure out how to cross uh, uh, sultana with Turiga national <laughs> <laughs> i think i think people should should really spend their time more wisely and, and do stuff that that really benefits the the, the human okay. population uh, i'm gonna send you a bottle of tarango yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, that, that's a good idea for a video. We're going to do only man-made crosses. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually did like a hybrid video um, at some point, and that that was not the most pleasant experience that I had uh, producing a YouTube video. So, so I don't know about that. But, but yeah, I mean, I'd be interested in tasting a tarango. Uh, sounds sounds delicious. Well, what 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 of all the sort of wines you've obviously tasted? you know, heaps and heaps of wine through the channel. Do you have, do you have a bias? Do you have, is there, is there like a group of varieties or flavors or profiles that you just naturally gravitate towards? I think, um, I think everyone does have like uh, a bias towards a certain kind of wine style or or certain grape varieties. Um, I try to switch that off when I rate wines, but obviously when it comes to preference, um, there are certain wines that I just enjoy drinking at home and other wines that I, I'd say, well, this is a great wine, but I, I don't want to drink it, you know. I, and not me personally. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't feel like uh, drinking that uh, over dinner. So, so there's certainly something, something there. But when it comes to rating wines and describing wines in my videos, I always try to make sure that people understand that uh, even though I might not love this wine, I still give it a good rating, and and I think uh, and and I explain why uh, or for whom this this might be a great choice, and vice versa. Sometimes I really love a wine and I don't rate it very highly, and I explain why this style is maybe not for everyone and just for just for certain people who enjoy a certain kind of wines. I mean that's the beauty of wine. There's a lot of different wines out there, um, a lot of different styles, uh, and, and you can kind of figure out what you like and what you don't like. Um, and this might also change over time. I mean, for me, it's, it certainly has changed over time. Um, but, but, I, but I'm still very truly interested in most wines, and I really enjoy tasting very different kind of styles and different wines at different price points. 
I, I, I was recently asked by someone who was, um, who was also in the wine business and wine media um, what, whether I, I'm not also kind of, I, I also don't like tasting certain styles of wines. And, and, and I, I do really still enjoy tasting uh, like Aldi wines. I mean, those are not the wines that I love to drink, but, but I still find it important and relevant and interesting to taste my way through the cheapest wines in the world, uh, taste my way through the biggest wines, like alcoholic monster wines, as well as uh, fine and elegant wines uh, and, and really expensive wines. I think uh, yeah, wine is one of the very few, if not the only product uh, that you can purchase for like one euro a unit. Uh, the same product, like fermented grape juice, might retail for 10,000 uh, euros a unit as well. So, so there's a huge difference uh, in terms of price for exactly the same product if you look at it like from, from, from a distance. Um, and the only difference is where the grapes were grown and which grape variety was used and some, some small differences in winemaking techniques. But in the end, it's all just fermented grape juice. And, mm. uh, and I find that fascinating. And I don't want to, even though I don't sit down in the evening drinking the leftovers from my Aldi wine tasting video, I, I still enjoy tasting those wines and being aware of what's going on in that, that segment of the market. So you mean you didn't just go off camera and just swig that entire <laughs> bottle of Great Wall? Yeah. Well, uh, no, I didn't. And, and I also didn't drink like the Tetra Pack, the one and a half liters of uh, off-dry, nondescript white wine from Spain. Uh, so, so no, I didn't. I'm, I'm not at that point right now, uh, at that point of my life where I get wasted with, with terrible wine. I tell you what you'd need though, you need like a vinegar mother because that okay, way yeah. at the end of all of these tastings, you can just build up, you know, the most incredible vinegar. Yeah, but I'd have way too much vinegar. I, I'd have yeah, to start selling vinegar. That's kind of... Dude, I'd buy KB's <laughs> vinegar. Okay. 100%. Well, 100%. All the wines tasted on the channel, guaranteed, guaranteed, everyone that watches your channel would love to be able to garner a bottle. It would be the most epic blend. Wouldn't it? Yeah, How that's actually an interesting, interesting idea. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll think about that. But, but yeah, <laughs> my, my, my house smells of wine already. That having it smell of vinegar as well might be, might be a bit of an issue. But, but yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. So, so is this, is this your house? Like your set is your like in the cellar of your house? This is actually in my cellar at home. So, so um, this is my, my, my house. Yeah. So, and this That's is all so real. Cool. Sometimes people ask me whether, I, I don't know why, but some people think this is a virtual background or whatever. But but it's actually it's actually real. Yeah. And and yeah, we we have a like a we have a very old house uh, and a very old cellar, uh, and this is kind of uh, where where I started things. I now have I've built a separate studio um, uh, somewhere somewhere in uh, in a warehouse in one of my warehouses, but. Um, uh, yeah, I still shoot most of my YouTube videos here, which oh, is that's because fantastic. I'm lazy, I think. And I, and I like this place. Yeah. We, we have this, um, I'm not sure, you definitely won't have this in Germany, but in Australia we have this, this concept that every, every man needs a shed, needs a place mm -hmm. to go uh, and, and, and go and work and just kind of, I don't know, take his frustrations out in the world. Is the cellar like your shed? So your family just occasionally you're like, look, I just need a minute, and then you just spend hours <laughs> down in the cellar. Well, uh, not really. It's it's pretty cold down here, so, so so you know it's not very comfortable. In 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 summer it's it's nice, but in winter it it can get a bit brutal down here. Um, but but yeah, no, I mean I I, I like my cellar, um, but I have lots of hideaways. I've got a few man caves. Uh, my 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 office is a bit of a man cave and. And the place where, where I got the other studio, I also got lots of, lots of stuff flying around, uh, guitars and uh, toys and books. So, so I sometimes hang out there. I actually, uh, I'm, I'm in true midlife crisis mode. I, I, just, I, I recently bought a skateboard and that's uh, hanging around there as, as well. So, so next time you see me, I might have two broken arms or something. But... <laughs> 
You mean you didn't do the typical YouTuber thing and just buy one wheel? Uh, right. Is that still a thing? I think that was it's... like Casey Neistat's influence, uh, but but that's waning now. No, no, I didn't didn't do that. Yeah. You're you're much more of an analog kind of guy. I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm actually quite quite digital, but but yeah, I I always wanted to uh, have a skateboard, and and now I have one, but I still still don't know what to do with it. So. <laughs> Well, tell us, how's the, because how, you've got a few different things that, like, for most people that, that just know you for YouTube side of things, you obviously have a whole sort of consultancy side of what you do. You've got bound selections, correct? Yep. As well as the online, there's a whole, like, online store, as well as your importing and distributing in Germany, yep. is that right? Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, most people nowadays know me for, for YouTube, but, but I really started uh, with my import and distribution business, which is Baum Selection. So, so we import wines from all around the world uh, and distribute it mainly in Germany, but also in some other European markets. But it's all uh, online. And that's kind of what I started with 10 years ago, pretty much exactly now. Um, and uh, and then as I got the Master of Wine uh, qualification, which was like a year later, 2015, I, I started doing more and more speaking engagements uh, and and other things. And so so now I basically have a communication agency. We do quite a lot of work with different uh, um, organizations like the California Wine Institute, uh, Vin de Centre Loire, uh, Prosecco, Fals, uh, Wines of Georgia. Um, lots of uh, lots of different regions, and uh, yeah, we're running quite a few events uh, um, all around Europe um, for for that. And then um, I also run the wine programs of of uh, one of the best hotels in in Germany, the Brands Park Hotel. Uh, I've been doing that for a while, and social media kind of started. Uh, or I've always enjoyed uh, doing stuff on social media. Uh, I started with Facebook and then kind of got into the other things. Um, and and YouTube was really something that I enjoyed the most. I really enjoyed watching YouTube videos, following other people on YouTube. And in 2020, I kind of decided to um, use the the time I had, the free time I had on my hand, as 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 uh, COVID kind of stopped uh, most of the traveling that I was doing to focus more on that. And that's kind of uh, how my, my, the current iteration of my YouTube channel um, started. And, and, and that's obviously become a thing. Uh, and, and just recently, we, just to make sure that I'm not getting bored, we, we launched a seller class, which is an online uh, e-learning platform, an independent e-learning platform um, I just felt that there's not enough uh, the wine world is doing online in order to really educate people, make sure that they they learn about wine and get deeper into the topic. Um, there are some great organizations that do that in person, like in, in classrooms all around the world, but not really. Um, not, there's not a lot uh, when it comes to online education. So so we launched seller class in order to kind of yeah get people. Uh, to to learn more about wine, uh, dive deeper into the topic, uh, and yeah, that was that that was the most recent edition. So so yeah, I'm I'm making sure that I stay busy. So how do you have a team there? Yeah, yeah. How big how big's your team across everything that you do? So we we uh, have like six people um, six people working for me. So so yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that certainly eases some of the load, but I, I can't imagine, uh, I reckon, I, I wouldn't wish management of people on my worst enemy. It's probably one of the hardest jobs next to being a parent. Yeah, I don't like, enjoy that either. But I mean, <laughs> parenting is much easier in my case, at least. I, yep. I, I, that's something I really, really love. Uh, I, have, I have two kids and uh, yeah, I, I really love them. That makes it, makes it I guess, easier <laughs> to, to deal with all the, the difficult bits. But yeah, management is also not something that I truly enjoy. I'm more of a doer. I'm kind of mm. someone who likes to make stuff, but not necessarily someone who likes to explain how to make stuff. And 
especially not someone who really enjoys listening to other people's problems and trying to figure out, <laughs> figure out how to solve them for them. But uh, no, I have a good team and they, they, are, they are very patient with me as well. Uh, and uh, and it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a thing. But, but yeah, management is not, certainly not something that I really enjoy doing. Uh, well, speaking of like listening to other people's problems and solving them, I noticed on your MW portfolio uh, that your, one of your specialities is uh, investment strategies for wine. Is there, oh, wow. I'm I try, need to I'm update that to... profile. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe I could get some free advice here. What, yeah. what should I be investing in, uh, in the world of wine? What do you reckon is like the next big thing? What, what's going to blow up next? Okay, um, so, so first and foremost, the reason why that is on there was that I, that I created that thing uh, close to 10 years ago and uh, back and never updated it since and, and back then I actually right before finishing the Master of Wine and setting up my own company I worked for a company called Livex which is based in in London and they are like a an online trading platform for for wine and they also uh, publish those indices that are uh, used by uh, many publications uh, that track the performance of the of the market, uh, the fine wine market. So, so back then, I actually knew a thing or two about wine investments, uh, even though I wasn't uh, I w wasn't the the biggest expert on that topic. But but yeah, I knew knew how how that works. Um, nowadays, I'm I've, I've I'm far less tuned in, I guess. Um, but uh, and and I and I can't give investment advice uh, anyways. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, just just a guy sitting in in his basement talking about wine. But <laughs> but, but 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 I think I mean I think the the thing is if you look at the market right now, um, Bordeaux, which was the most dominant category by far when when I worked at Livex, uh, like I think Lafitte was kind of uh, making up a. a a quarter maybe of the turnover on the platform so so that was the time when Lafitte was all the rage in China was really into mm. uh, Bordeaux wines and prices went up like crazy was that and the that dro is, drops of god effect yeah maybe that and and it was just i think it was also governmental uh, spending back then uh, back then uh, the mm. gov government employees were buying expensive wines to have them at their banquets and and mm. use them as as I don't know bribes or gifts, whatever you want to call it, uh, and and so so there was there was uh, quite a lot uh, going on uh, from that side, and they they stopped that uh, at some point, um, and I think ever since then Bordeaux uh, has has been struggling. There are other reasons for that as well, mm -hmm. and and nowadays I mean the the prices are still pretty high, but it's certainly not as easy to sell Bordeaux wines now compared to what it was like back then. Burgundy. Mm -hmm was then the next big thing and is probably still one of the big things that has increased in value significantly. But the issue there is really um, that, that you can't really get your hands on, on most of those products. They, they are just produced in small amounts mm. and, and it's difficult to find them um, and really establish a price, a market price for those wines. If they're not traded regularly, you can't really say the market says this is worth a thousand euros. So, mm -hmm. and I, I guess getting into Burgundy is, I, I think, probably not a great idea nowadays because um, those wines are just too expensive already and I don't know where else they are supposed to go. I mean, uh, there's, uh, it's, it, uh, yeah, I, I think there's not a lot of room to, to, to grow in terms of prices there. Um, I mean, mm. Germany, I think, is, is interesting. If you look at uh, German, German Riesling and uh, Pinots, they, like I said, they still represent values, but, but uh, they've increased in price quite a bit over the last 10 years. Um, I think 10 years ago, finding uh, German Große Gewächs Rieslings for 20, 30 euros was not difficult nowadays. Most of them are uh, 50 to 150 euros. Mm. Um, so, mm. so, so they are, they, they, they've, uh, they're still affordable, if you want to call it uh, that. But, but uh, they, they, they've increased in, in value, and maybe uh, in 10 years' time, they, they'll be even more expensive. 
certainly those ones can age, which is obviously mm. a risk mitigation strategy. If you put a lot of money into a wine, then uh, you want to make sure that it keeps for 10, 15 years before you want to sell it again. And German Rieslings have a reputation for aging really well. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, maybe there's there's an opportunity there, but but again, no no financial advice here. It's it's just uh, just a random guess, really. <laughs> it's funny we we watched the prices in Australia for Jura this year just mm. almost double. Okay, um, you know that was absolutely incredible. Again, you know probably a bit of a halo effect from Burgundy, but it seems to be like one of the wines that really got put on a pedestal, at least in Australia. Um, you know, out of the natural wine movement. Yeah. How's how's that movement being perceived in Germany at the moment? I think there is less excitement when it comes to natural wines nowadays in Germany um, compared to five to ten years ago. That back then it was kind of this new thing that everyone wanted to taste and everyone had an opinion on it. Um, and there were lots of really bad natural wines uh, available in the market, so so things where people just didn't know what they were doing, producing wines that were badly faulty, just kind of mm. putting a fancy, fun label on it and then selling it uh, at a at a fairly elevated price uh, for for a product like that. And nowadays, I think uh, more conventional wineries are also looking at the way they make wine and uh, which additions they want to use, uh, especially how much sulfur they want to add to the wine. And uh, I think that's how natural wines impact will be felt for for the next decades to come. So, so, so this kind of extreme example of winemaking impacted other wineries trying to kind of... Uh, be a little bit more conscientious about what they do in the winery and then um, producing wines that are that wouldn't be considered natural but uh, but are uh, influenced by the natural wine movement but uh, but I think there's less interest in natural wine nowadays compared to what it was um, a few years ago and I think for me personally natural wine um, doesn't really need to exist, in my opinion. I, I don't. I, I really don't like the term natural wine because wine is never a natural product. I mean, if you want natural wine, you need to kind of go into the forest and find find a wild vine and uh, wait until the grapes drop on the ground and start fermenting, and that's that's kind of natural wine for you. Careful, Kep, you're, you're giving me ideas. You're giving me amazing <laughs> ideas. I mean, the, I, I think there are probably. There's someone who's done that before, but but yeah, and I mean that's that's natural wine uh, uh, for you, and if you enjoy that, well, <laughs> good on you. But 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 if you if you uh, if you make wine, you're a winemaker, and and you you harvest grapes at a certain point of time that were trained in a certain way in the vineyard, and that you've cared and uh, uh, looked after. For uh, for the whole season, and then harvest them, bringing them into your winery, put them into a fermenter, even if it's fermented spontaneously, um, it's still a product that you've made. It's a cultural product, um, and I think actually that's what, what makes wine great. Um, it it might not sound as nice as a buzz term like uh, uh, cultural wine, but but. But it's uh, but it's but it's really what makes wine great. I mean, wine wine has been around for such a long time because people find it find it important in one way or the other, and they've made it in so many different places, uh, mm. and it has become part of our culture, of our way, the way we eat food, the way we uh, um, practice our faith, the way we l look at art and and uh, the way we look at music and all kinds of things. It has touched so many different things. Um, so so that's really what, what makes wine interesting, not whether it's natural or not. And and yeah, mm. pretty much all of the wine I've, I've tasted in my life is not natural. Um, so, so, so yeah, that's why I don't really like that term. On top of that, it's really badly defined um, I mean Correct. yeah there are quite a lot of producers who call them their wine natural 
but some add sulfites, some don't. Uh, some add minimal amounts of sulfites, whatever that means. Some, some K- add... KB, this is it's about the vibe, man. It's just all about the vibe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I personally, I'm not here to judge anyone and to tell them what to do or what not to do. I just, I just kind of uh, think that. Um, yeah, I, that, that's not something that I need. I, I, I don't mm. enjoy a wine more because it's, it's natural, whatever that, mm. that means. I don't enjoy a wine more if it has 15 milligrams of sulfites rather than 35. You know, that just doesn't mean anything to me. If the wine is well made, uh, I enjoy mm. that. I obviously also enjoy wines more that have a nice story and that are made by uh, people that I find interesting. Um, made mm. with a certain thought or concept in mind rather than just uh, I'm making wine in order to make money. Uh, that's that's obviously not as interesting uh, f- for me Wait, either. Who's, but, ma- who's making money in wine? <laughs> I actually I actually <laughs> listened to this podcast yesterday, um, which is one of the best podcasts, I think, out there. Uh, not not a wine podcast. Uh, How I built this, uh, it's called. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard of, heard of that before, but but you should definitely check it out. It's about people who started businesses and they kind of talk about the story of how they uh, developed the the business. And it's usually a very honest and kind of nice uh, kind of conversa- conversation and shows you that even the biggest companies they well some of them were accidents. Some mm. everyone had. Had issues building their companies, everyone uh, was afraid to fail, and all that kind of stuff. So, so you mm. and you and me, we're both entrepreneurs. So we sometimes need <laughs> need that feedback to realize that we are not alone with our problems. But, but yeah, anyways. So, so, so I listened to that podcast of the people who um, who created Barefoot, um, the wine brand. Oh, Barefoot. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah, because. Um, some people or many people think Barefoot is actually a brand that Gallo uh, created, um, mm. but but Barefoot was created by this couple who uh, they they weren't they weren't in the wine business at all. I mean, th- uh, one of them was sometimes working as a consultant for wine businesses, uh, uh, but but yeah, they they weren't in the wine business at all, and they kind of started off with this um, this wine that they bought from from a winery that went bankrupt. And and they kind of developed the the brand Barefoot, which uh, is a is an interesting story in and of itself. Because I mean, who puts a foot onto a label? You know, <laughs> cause, cause it, the <laughs> same sort of people that put a kangaroo onto a label, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that kind of makes more sense. But having a foot on the label is just kind of like. You know, I, I once made a, a Pinot in my basement here and recorded it on, on a video and I was stomping the grapes by, by foot and, and there were quite a lot of comments there talking about I'm the sorry. fact that that's disgusting. But Barefoot is taken. You can't use that. <laughs> yeah, too late. But, but yeah, so, so, so just to come back to that question that you asked, who makes money, um, they actually never really, I mean, they, they made money in terms of like, Turnover, but but profitability was always kind of an issue for them. Mm. Uh, even though at some point they they were also profitable, and they created one of the m- most successful wine brands uh, out there. Uh, and they obviously made money when they sold that brand to Gallo um, for for mm. an undisclosed sum. But I guess that that was quite a lot of money um, that. Um, that they made uh, by selling it, but but yeah, I mean, it's I think it's very difficult to to make money in producing wine. That's that's for sure. Um, there there's some other sectors that are a bit more profitable, but but yeah, mm. it's yeah making wine. It, cer- it certainly seems to be generational. That's where I think because you're working with an annual cadence yeah. of grapes, that that timeline of bringing things to market and having it move through the market, then having that, those funds reinvested into the company. It's just at yeah. a, such a slow tempo mm. um, that you either need to get started really young or be really lucky or inherit something. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the the cost of setting up like a winery and you know much more about that than, than me, but, but that's just, there's so much money that you have invest have to invest in order to get started and then you end up yeah having to pay off 
that debt uh, by uh, through the income that you generate and obviously if you have a bad season sometimes you might not be able to make any profits that year or um, mm. sometimes not even really a lot of money at all uh, so so uh, that that that's yeah that's a really tough situation i mean i actually i started my company like with a very small loan that i got from 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 someone in my family like just just like uh, donald trump actually um, I, was, this, I was about to say <laughs> i was about to say the small, small loan from my dad of one million dollars. No, no, no. It was just like, like a, a really small. It was the, the, like a, a few. I, I mean, it was a few thousand, but but it was really not not a lot of money, and 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 uh, I kind of uh, b became debt free uh, very early on, and I don't have any debt, uh, and and, I'm, and that's something that I really really like about what I do because uh, yeah, having to talk to the bank every every other mo month explaining to them how the market works and what uh, issues uh, you're facing at the moment that must be so frustrating so yeah. so yeah and 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 it, that's just not possible unless you are Donald Trump uh, to kind of start a, start a winery without without uh, taking on a huge amount of debt and kind of working working your way through it for for decades in order to kind of uh, yeah have have your own thing. But it hasn't all been sort of rosy for you. I remember reading somewhere that you almost closed up your like shut down YouTube before COVID. You weren't even going to continue on with it. Um, yeah, I mean, but but that was kind of uh, I mean my YouTube channel before COVID was basically me and my mom uh, uh, exchanging. <laughs> Exchanging tasting notes, <laughs> like me in the video and she in the comments. No, no, not really. But but it was kind of like be, be, before COVID, I um, I actually uh, posted like a video a year maybe uh, on on that channel, and it was kind of uh, in German. So so the audience, the potential audience, was much smaller, anyways. And there were maybe I don't know. I I think uh, when I when I made the switch. I had maybe 400 subscribers on on my on my YouTube channel, so so not not a lot at all, and and I had posted maybe eight nine videos uh, on on that channel, so so it wasn't really a thing. It was just some. Mm. It was an aspiration. It was something that I wanted to do, but not something uh, I actually had done. So so mm. so it was kind of something when I started. Um, when I started uh, my my company, I kind of thought, well, this might be a nice way uh, to to get attention from people, and then so many other things came up, so that I just didn't really do it. And I also didn't really enjoy making videos, to be honest. I I, I still sometimes I much prefer kind of uh, editing a video, even though I'm not doing that anymore either. But 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 I, I much prefer like researching for a video or thinking about the concept rather than just kind of sitting down talking to the camera and doing all that i don't know what the what it is like for you i i assume maybe if you have people around you it, it's more fun or more in, engaging but but yeah i i really don't like that or didn't like that process and i still sometimes just don't feel like recording a video our our, our problem is we need we have too many ideas mm. we literally just fielded one today i'm not sure if it's locked in or not you're going to get the scoop on this okay so we will likely be in about a year's time flying to mexico to make wine wow uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so these are the sort of big thinking ideas we're after here at wine for the people no okay. so we're, we're, we're thinking about well i don't know uh, we're Big on underdog regions, underdog wineries, um, and I think making wine in Mexico would probably make a pretty sick video. Um, mm -hmm. Unico Baja has a bit of a ring to it, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I know they make really good Nebbiolo there, actually. Okay. Um, so, why, I'm thinking but maybe, why not? Why not Germany? I mean, why Mexico? Uh, well, I mean, hey, dude, I'm open to collaborations. Hundred <laughs> uh, <laughs> percent. We could do, we could do Unico Baum. Um, that, yeah. that could work pretty well. That could work yeah, pretty well. So, I mean, sounds, sounds I great. I would love to do the Unico version of wine in your cellar. That would be yeah. <laughs> that would that would definitely be fun. I think um, 
I don't know, with Germany, Germany, I've, I've kind of fallen in love with German ones. I mean, we've always a very big Riesling, um, like consuming country in Australia. Mm. Um, but Spätburgunder, holy crap. That's, that's something that Australians need to know about. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, we just had two, two wineries hit the water. It's the first time we've ever imported wine before. So we've got two wineries hit the water. Um, uh, which ones, and, which ones are they? Which ones did you? We ended up with, um, one slightly larger one, or I guess medium size. So cop. Um, yeah, that's, Baden, that's Baden. the one we talked about. That's in my neighborhood. Mm. Cop is yeah. like 10 minutes away from my house. So there you go. they're producing great, great Pinot. I actually have a bottle back there. I don't know. <laughs> really? I don't know whether that, go, go that works with this, this <laughs> so, cable here, but I have, a, <laughs> I have a bottle right here of uh, Kopp hey. Ronnenberg Spätburgunder 2013. And that was, um, that was actually, uh, I, I'm judging on a jury from a bigger uh, magazine, not a wine magazine, but like a, a German uh, magazine. And, and they, they do an annual German wine uh, uh, competition. And he, with that wine, he won uh, the best Pinot in Germany uh, award. And there were lots of really great wineries in the mix. And he, he came out on top. So, so that's, oh, that's a beautiful bottle. And I, I found this one bottle. I think he doesn't even have any of that uh, left. And uh, so I might might be holding one of the last bottles uh, there. Oh so, wow! So next time you come, then we we open it if it lasts that long. But I'm gonna I'm gonna hold I'm gonna hold you to that because I think we're gonna be back pretty pretty soon. We've um I've got a friend there who's now become the wine for the people German correspondent. Oh wow! Um, okay. Ali. Yeah. Um, okay. But we're also bringing in Daniel Fries, um, from the Terrasse and Moselle. All right. Um, yeah, they uh, he's grandfather was um, smart or dumb enough to plant Pinot where mm. Riesling probably should have gone and then it didn't really yield for like 20 years but he was stubborn enough to leave it in the ground okay. um, and, and courtesy of a little bit of climate change um, we now have Pinot in the Terrasse and Mosul oh, wow. um, and so we thought we'd, we'd bring his, his stuff in very very impressed very impressed but there's, there's a fraction like if I wanted right now to buy a bottle of German Pinot, mm -hmm. uh, I have probably three, maybe four producers in Australia that I can choose from. That's all. No, okay. Which seems really dumb. That's because, not enough, yeah. No, the quality is so good. The quality is so, so good. I was just so impressed. And the price points are really competitive, especially when your sort of nearest comparison would be Germany. Oh, sorry, would be Burgundy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, looking forward to, to having those land. And, and yes, you'll see us again in, in Germany. Great. Hopefully some, for some old, old wines. Are you worried that you're going to become the old wine guy? After, well, I'm like, the, worried that, that I'll... That blew you up, right? I'm worried that I'll be the, the old guy very soon. <laughs> I, I, I kind of, I'm still, I'm still, uh, I, I still have on, on my, on my stuff, I still write down that I'm the oldest, uh, the youngest master of wine in Germany. So, so, so that has to change at some point uh, as well. But no, the old wine guy, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously uh, the video that really uh, did it for me and, and my YouTube channel was this uh, video when I, when I opened this bottle of uh, 18, 63 uh, Burmester port uh, which which I had discovered in my cellar uh, and and that was kind of uh, obviously a, a big moment but it, but it's but but it's not um, it's not really it, I also learned that 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 that's not repeatable necessarily so it's, it's not if, if you bring out an even older bottle it doesn't mean that more people will watch it uh, so 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 I'm I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I, I try to experiment with lots of different uh, formats and ideas and concepts um, in order to kind of find out what people want uh, and want, want to see. Uh, so so I've, I'm, I'm not just the old wine guy. I think I'm also the like ex stupidly expensive wine guy, the, the uh, Aldi wine guy, the, the guy that... that uh, uh, talks about the summer year world championship <laughs> so, so 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 in the in the top 10 uh, i kind of have like a, a good mix of different formats and i'm actually 
working on something right now that might be another one I think that that kind of brings wine more into the mainstream I, I don't really want to kind of make wine or dumb down wine or make it a, mm. like a fine wine a mainstream product but I, I feel like sometimes us in the wine world the deeper we get involved in it we, we just kind of really just want to go deeper and deeper and mm. we're losing a lot of people uh, who, who, who don't want to go all, the, all that deep because of that and people all of a sudden think they need to know what uh, the grape variety Jacquea does in Savoie uh, in order to really be part of this community. And I think there are some, some uh, areas, some topics that interest a lot of people um, and, and uh, are still also exciting wine uh, topics. And th those are the topics I, I search for. Not all the time, mm. not, not for every video, but, but for some videos. So, so like having this very old bottle that one of my relatives gave me uh, and I didn't realize that it was something special. I didn't realize that it was from the 1863 vintage. I thought that was the year the winery was founded. So, so it was kind of like, okay, nice, thank you, an old bottle, that's probably crap. And then I realized later on that it might be from that vintage and might be actually really delicious. That's, I think, something that lots of people are interested in. That's something that reaches people who have no interest in wine and all of a sudden kind mm. of see that story uh, in front of their eye as they scroll through the YouTube feed and go, ah, oh, that's something that interests me. Just like when it comes to tasting really expensive wines, like I, I had a video where I looked for a bottle of Petrus and found a bottle in a local, at a local retailer uh, and bought that uh, and kind of opened it and made it, made it an experience. I think that's something um, that people are interested in. So as soon as I, when I t tell a, a story or a concept to, or explain it to one of my friends or relatives, and most of them, they have really no interest in wine. If I, if I tell them about it and they kind of go, ah, oh, that's really interesting, tell mm -hmm. me more. And that, that's kind of when I start thinking, well, this, this might actually be something that, that opens up the wine nerd niche to uh, a co completely different audience so, so. that's interesting so do, do you bounce ideas off sort of families and friends to yeah i mean yeah. with this new new thing and i unfortunately can't talk about it yet but 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 that's something i discussed at a family reunion uh, this last weekend um and and no one at the table really had interest in wine i mean they all kind of drink wine or most of them do but but no one really wants to know anything. Like when I start talking about wine, they all kind of stop listening usually. So, so uh, but when I taught them about this and what, I, what I'm trying to do there, that's kind of, everyone was kind of like engaged and interested. Um, and and uh, so, so I do that, yeah. I, I, I do that more with people out from outside of the wine world rather than people from inside of the wine world. But because in those, for those for that com that community I know fairly well and I understand what they what they are looking for and what they might want to see and obviously also when it comes to YouTube you always have to think about how does this kind of translate into a, a thumbnail and a title because mm. that's kind of everything when it comes to YouTube really I mean the execution mm. and the production of the video is also important but when it comes to being successful on YouTube it's all about like having a thumbnail that is easy to understand and a title that summarizes that topic neatly but makes it really interesting so mm. so that people really have to click on it um, as it is it's such a such an, a unique or interesting concept and idea and and uh, and that's that's something i i always try to bear in mind but but i'm also i'm not i don't want to be like the biggest YouTuber in the world. I have no aspirations to become like the next Mr. Beast at all. Mm -hmm. I have no chance to do that. But, but, um, but I think there is certainly space in that uh, in that world for for wine, and and there there should be much more uh, interest in that topic uh, mm -hmm. in in the world in general. And I think YouTube is a good way to get more people involved and interested in the topic of wine. And I, I've said it many times, I think there's certainly space for a few YouTube channels, wine YouTube channels that have more than a million subscribers. I think that there is, there are not enough people who are interested in that topic. That, so, 
if that happened to us, that would freak me the f out. I, I mean, is that not something you 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 consider an aspiration? Is that not something that you would want to want to see? Um, no, I mean, the thing that would that would break me would be the sheer amount of comments. What would probably happen to the Discord group would probably explode. Mm. Um, I mean, sure, I think it would be it would be fun because it would be an indicator of like an indicator of success, but it's not not the type of success that that I guess we're measuring ourselves on. Like for me, it's just I would like to see more young people engaging with wine in a meaningful way. Yeah. Uh, and if we've got a million subscribers, we've somehow managed to contribute to one of the most amazing communities that's managed to, to, to grow. That would be the the only thing that that would prove to us because um, like I said the, the money's not, we spend so much goddamn money on this channel that the money's no longer become, <laughs> it's just a bit of a blur now. No. Um, that, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be, yeah, it's not like something we wake up to to kind of go, we want to have a million subscribers. I, I agree with you though. I do think that the, um, the, the scope and scale of where wine sits at to where it could be on YouTube particularly is so far off base at the moment. And like one of the big things that we look at is say India, you know, mm. one of the largest consumers of, of users of YouTube, um, where there's currently a million other, I think this metric is correct. One million new, um, uh, people who are of age drinking every month mm. in, in, in India. I think that's correct. Or maybe it's every day. Something okay. absolutely bonkers. Um, yeah. And without people actually communicating in a way that they're going to be able to understand and comprehend um, or enjoy or find relatable, then wine's going to be sort of, my fear is that wine gets forgotten about. Yeah. Um, I don't think the wine industry does a very good job at being out. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, mm. it sucks at every time we try to put wine on a television. It sucks. Um, yeah, I mean, don't, you know. don't, don't go, don't, I, I actually tried to do, go the, down the television road, route as well. I've been on a few shows here in Germany and, and this is just not something you want to involve, be involved in. I think we are in a much better space uh, as we can really create something meaningful that uh, is not on a dying medium. Uh, and, and I think uh, YouTube is now, I think the, the, biggest streaming app in the world uh, for television so 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 you 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 manage to get on tv quite a lot of my viewers are on on uh, watching my stuff on tv so so i think it's like a third to close to half of no, about more, more like 40 percent every depending on the month so 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 yeah i think i also i mean it's not my aspiration to get to a million subscribers i just that's not that's a random number i actually wanted to cross the 100,000 subscriber bit uh, th that barrier because uh, there there weren't and aren't many wine channels that have done that uh, mm -hmm. and 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 i kind of just wanted to do that as a proof of concept really but but it's not like i now want to cross the a million subscribers that's not 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 important but i think it is there is certainly room for for wine mm. channels on YouTube to to get to that point. I mean, there are coffee channels like uh, James Hoffman. I don't know whether you know that guy. He's yeah, awesome, he's, wicked he's, dude. Yeah, he's he's awesome. Yeah. Uh, he he uh, is the the coffee nerd, and he kind of makes those videos uh, where where people have to sit through half an hour of him explaining <laughs> something about coffee machines. And and he has like more than two million subscribers. I I think um, yeah. so. So wine certainly there, there's a mm. gap there. I think what we need to need to uh, just understand is how to how to get to that audience, how to mm. produce compelling content. Um, but obviously, if you're just going for views or subscribers, you might lose your lose your way. Uh, mm. um, but but if you if you build a nice community out there. For, for wine lovers, uh, um, if it gets bigger and bigger, that's that's a beautiful thing too. And having having people engage with each other, and uh, and at some point, obviously, you won't be able to manage all the sheer amount of comments and uh, uh, reactions and shares and whatever. Um, but that's fine too. I I 
I sometimes have periods where I just can't interact with my community um, uh, and, and most of them are fine with that too. They are, they are quite understanding when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I'll jump back into it and, and uh, react and comment back and do stuff like that. So, so yeah. Well, Constantine, we are well and truly over our time. As I expected, we basically got through only half the questions uh, <laughs> we had prepared. Mate, thank you so much. Honestly, thank you for your time. Um, but also thank you for everything that you've been doing and you have done and also the support for us at the channel. It's been huge for us. You know, you were mentioning before how, uh, like, listening to uh, a podcast um, about, like, other small business owners and the trials and tribulations they go through, it's... It's, you've got a unique perspective into the stuff that we do. Um, mm. Even just the 10 minute, 20 minute chat before we even hit record about trying to figure out cameras and shit. Like, yeah, that was fun. Only, only people that post on YouTube are going to know about the pain, the real pain. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but I, I, really, I really love your, your stuff. I always thought you guys deserve to have an have a, have a, uh, audience um, because you're bringing something unique to YouTube as well. What I'm not a big fan of is really just kind of people trying to do stuff that is successful and copying it or do, mm. doing, doing, doing the same thing that others are doing. And you just have so many great ideas and you have a great team there as well, a very nice dynamic amongst you, you guys when you taste together and, and talk. So, so I think that's really enriching the, the world of uh, world of wine and my mission is to make sure that the world tastes better and I think uh, you 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 are you are also achieving that with what you are doing. Right. Very very kind. Um, I'm going to leave you to you the rest of your day um, and I'm going to finish off some Riesling. All right. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> I'm jealous now. Cheers, <laughs> Cheers mate.